Okay, so uh, some of you know, if you've been following along, you know that we have been in a series uh, on knowing our why uh, as a church. And a, a lot of that has focused on uh, things that we're called to do, right? To, to love God, uh, to prioritize people, and to bless the world. Uh, in this sort of second half of this series, uh, we're going to talk some about uh, how we are the church. And this actually ends up reflecting back on, on some of the why. Uh, we're going to intro, oops, hmm, okay, oh, I know what happened. <laughs> I, uh, I sent these, I sent these, uh, these uh, slides late last night, and uh, this morning I switched the order in my notes, but I didn't send them the updated one, so that's on me. Uh, in this series, we're going to introduce a couple of, of biblical images of the church. Uh, they both end up making an appearance in the chapter that we're going to look at this morning, Colossians chapter 3. And we'll be exploring these over the next few weeks. Um, the first image, which is represented by that lower right graphic, is the image of the body. Uh, in Colossians, it says that we are called in one body. And we'll be talking about some of the implications of that. Next week, uh, Monica Muldoon is going to come and preach from 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, to, to really get into some of this body stuff. Uh, just by way of introduction today, I'm going to note that uh, our being the body has implications for the way that we relate to one another. Uh, it, 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 it demands a certain quality of relationship for us to be able to function. Um, the second image that we'll introduce is one of family, but it's a, it's a special kind of family. This actually is not in our passage for this morning. It's one verse before, but Paul talks about uh, being a family in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, uh, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Uh, that's not the only statement that he makes like that in the Bible. There are actually three of these statements uh, where he talks about social divisions in the world that are treated differently within the church family. So uh, in, in this passage, he talks about ethnic divisions, like between Greek and Jew that could also be um, well, I guess it's, yeah, it's cultural. And, and then he also talks about slave and free, uh, which are, uh, which are uh, social status divisions. In, a, in our culture, uh, where slavery is now illegal, thank God, um, some of those social distinctions might be between rich and poor, or between less educated and more educated. Um, a third one that he introduces in Colossians, uh, Colossians, in Galatians chapter 3, is male and female. Uh, so the, the gender thing that, that Shannon had, had, uh, had mentioned earlier. I, I want to be clear on this. He's not saying that those distinctions uh, don't exist anymore. Or, or that they don't matter at all. That they're not important. Uh, he's not saying that. What he is saying is that in this new family that God is forming, those differences don't determine uh, what we can do in the body, uh, what kinds of ministry we can perform, um, yeah, what kind of position we can hold. And that's an important distinction uh, because male and female still matter. Uh, social distinctions can still matter. Uh, 
ethnic distinctions can still matter. I note that we've started Black History Month, and I'm sure that in a room like this, there are people who have all different reactions to that. Um, you know, some people think, well, why do we need black history? Um, why don't we just have history? Um, and the answer to that question is that uh, black history month became a thing because when we just talked about history, nobody talked about black history. <laughs> They didn't talk about the things, the, the prominent uh, black individuals of the past or, or events that affected them uh, very often. And so they kind of got washed out in the sea uh, of everything else. And so the hope in something like Black History Month is not to make uh, black people higher or more important or anything else, uh, but to try to see and love and appreciate uh, a people group that we might otherwise overlook. And so, um, yeah, in our, in our setting, uh, this becomes important because when we look at one another, we can still see the distinctions. It's not wrong uh, to see someone's nationality or to see their gender uh, or to see other things about them that help to make who they are. Um, I grew up, so I, you know, I, I grew up in the 1960s in Texas. And the, uh, it's like, does anybody even know where that is? Um, it's in a whole other country. But, um, but the, the ideal at that time uh, was this, this uh, idea of, of color blindness, right? I'm just not going to see those things. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to see that you're Chinese. Uh, I'm not going to see that you're uh, a man, or at that point, a boy. Um, I'm just going to see a generic person. And the truth is, there are no generic people, Amen. right? Every single one of us has these unique, or at least special, characteristics that are part of who we are. And to not see that becomes hugely problematic. To not see that I'm Chinese is to miss a lot about my growing up, to miss a lot about the way that I've learned to see the world. You know, I'm, I'm married, and I've been married for a long time. But, uh, you know, back in my single days, if, if I had uh, been with a female friend and she had said, you know, I just really like being your friend. And when, when I look at you, I don't see a man. <laughs> like, you know, you, you're just like me. I would have thought, okay, this is both disturbing <laughs> and maybe a little insulting, right? Like, <laughs> why can't you tell that I'm a man? Um, so, so we want to see each other. We just don't want to we don't want to uh, decide who's important and who's not based on those characteristics. We don't want to decide who can lead and who can't lead based on those characteristics. Um, so anyway, over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at our life together as a church through this lens of these two different kinds of, uh, of, of images, the image of, uh, of the body, in, in particular being Christ's body, and uh, the image of a, of a special kind of family. So now I'm going to see if I can. Okay, okay I, I seem to be stuck. Can we roll me back uh, to Colossians 3? Keep going back. There you go. Thank you. Now maybe I'll turn this off and turn it back on and see if it resets. Okay, nice. All right, so we're going to look in Colossians 3. If you have your Bibles, you can open them with me to Colossians 3 uh, to get some help with what our life together is supposed to be like. I had originally entitled this message, The Church is a Worshiping Community, and you may see why by the time that we're done. 
Uh, Colossians 3, starting in verse 12, it says, So, as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Boy, I just don't know what's going on with this thing. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, through him to God the Father. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, be our teacher and our guide in this time. We open our, our minds, our hearts, our whole lives, Lord, uh, to be as open to you as we know how. And we invite you to come and to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Next slide there. Thank you. So, so Paul says that we are chosen holy, and beloved. Uh, a few observations about these terms. One of them is that those of you who've like read the Bible over the years and such might recognize that all of these terms were applied to Israel in the Old Testament. They're the chosen people of God. They've been that they're holy, you know, they're, they're, they're set apart for God's purposes. And, and they are beloved. They're dearly loved by God. And so, so part of what Paul is saying here is that we too are part of God's chosen people. Um, that, that we are... Are, are holy, that we have been set apart by God for his purposes in the world. That's what holiness is. And then we are beloved, which means that we are not just a means to an end, right? Uh, God involves us in his mission in the world, but it it's not like God made us so he could get things done, right? <laughs> you, you would be able to, like, if you reason that all the way through, you'll realize, yeah, we are not a very efficient uh, way to get things done. God works with us because he loves us. He, he wants us to have a piece of something that will last. Uh, and we are not just a means to an end. Uh, Michelle told this story uh, of when she was, you know, when she was much younger, right, uh, in her childhood. But, but she, was, she was exasperated by her mom, like, giving her household chores and these kinds of things to do. And she said, you know, you just had us, you know, because you wanted slaves. And uh, <laughs> a, a lot of children have felt that way about their parents, I think. But, uh, but, you know, the real truth is that children are expensive and they're a ton of work, right? Like, your life would be so much simpler without children. And so, so, so no parent has children for all the work they can get out of them. Um, at least none I've ever met. Um, having, having children is something you do because you, you want to share what you've been given, right? You want to be generous and to, uh, to give your life 
uh, to someone, for someone. It's, it's, a, it's a choosing of sacrifice. It's a choosing of inconvenience. And this is what God has done with us. Um, and so he, he calls us to a particular kind of life together. Uh, if we get to the next slide there. Oops, next one. There you go. Thank you. So, so th this is just like an outline of what we just read in the passage, right? I, I tried to organize it a little bit, but this is, this is the way that, that Paul is saying God wants us to live together. But before we jump into this list, I want to be clear that the reason that we're supposed to live like this is because of who we are as those two images, right? That we are a special kind of family and that we are the body of Jesus. In particular, I wanted to focus on the body this morning because it's right in this passage. You can see it there in red. Uh, it's right in the middle of Paul's list of, of, of ways that we're supposed to live with one another. He says it's because we were called in one body. And so this idea of the body has, has certain implications for us. Think about your own body. So your body is made up of, of different kinds of members that, that perform different functions. Uh, Monica's going to get into this next week and kind of look at it up close for us. But uh, for now, it's enough to know that we're all made different, and that is by design. Uh, years ago, there was a, there was a, a group at Fuller Seminary uh, called the Church Growth Institute. And they, they, they studied churches that grew very large and were trying to uh, find the principles of church growth so that they could help all these churches to become giant. And, uh, you know, one of the things that they came up with was a thing called the homogeneous unit principle. Uh, just a fancy way of saying that it's easier to gather a larger group of people if they're more alike. So, so rather than trying to, like, gather people from different nations, for instance, that, that's just a recipe for miscommunication, um, cross-cultural conflict, and all that kind of thing. You know, you focus in on a narrower segment of the population, and, and you can gather a bigger group. Uh, so some aspects of this homogeneity unit principle uh, are just common sense, Right? Uh, we're here doing a service in English, and so almost all the people in the room are people who either understand English or want to. Um, you know, the, the people who don't want to understand English or don't understand English enough, they go somewhere else if they go anywhere. So there, there's a certain amount that we, that we have in common. Uh, but I was troubled, and I was not the only one, uh, by this idea of the homogeneity unit principle, it, it is true that it's way easier to get along when we're all from one segment of the population. We're all middle-class, college-educated young adults. Well, it makes your programming easier, it makes communication easier, it makes relationships and scheduling and doing meetings and all that stuff way easier. But the question is, is it faithful to who we're called to as a body? Uh, to be made up of different kinds of parts. And it, even more so when you think about this idea of a special family. We'll, we'll get into that the third week of this series. Uh, I, I question it. It may be easier to gather a bigger group of people but we need each other because of the differences. So it makes it harder, for sure. And, you know, it's like we all have different assumptions about, uh, I don't know, about what good food is for the potluck. You know, something as mundane as that. Should it be spicy? Answer? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I recognize that everybody's answer is not yes, which honestly frustrates me. <laughs> like I just want to get you guys up here and pray <laughs> that you will be healed. But, but we're different, and we, we need... We need the differences. Second thing about the body is the body uh, demands that the parts be connected to one another. It's not enough to know that I have a specific function and Chris has a different function and uh, Linda has a different function. We, we've all got these different functions, but then we never communicate with each other. We never rub shoulders with each other. Uh, a body doesn't work that way. For a body to work, it has to be connected, and the parts have to communicate with one another. A third thing about this body imagery and the reason that Paul tells us to live in this way, which we're going to get into shortly, is that we are called to common purpose. And that requires a certain amount of coordination. Like, my right arm is my stronger arm. My right hand is my stronger hand. But if it decides that it's going to do its own thing, it's not going to do what the rest of the body is trying to do. It just wants to go off and do what it wants to do. Then my body will be all over the place. I can't get anything done. Um, and so, so... Being the body implies this life of, of, of like staying together even though we're different, of, uh, of being in contact and communication with each other, and of being coordinated, of, of, of having common purpose together. And this is why Paul says these things about the way that we're supposed to live. Let's break it down a little bit. Uh, one thing he says is that we are to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Uh, he also says that we are to put on love. And that, that language of putting something on, I don't want you to get the wrong idea about that. For some people, that sounds superficial, right? Like, I could put on a jacket and then, you know, I'm wearing a different color, but that's not actually me. Um, that's not what he means by putting on. Uh, you can tell partly because he says put on a heart, right? It's an internal thing. Uh, and I think what he means with putting on is that there's a choice that you have to make. You, you have to will for something to happen. You have to choose to put these things on. And that's a helpful thing for those of us who are trying to follow Jesus. I, I think some people, they come to Christ and they're just thinking that everything is going to be great. Like, it's all going to be sort of automatic. And God's going to come in, he's going to take over, and then everything will be right in my life. And it's like, the way that God has set this up is that we still have to choose. We have to put on a heart of compassion and kindness, etc. It's available, but we still have to choose it, which means that we can sometimes choose the opposite. Uh, we can, uh, you know, we we can choose offense and uh, arrogance and roughness with one another, impatience. Um, we can choose to not put on love. And so, so we have to choose. Uh, and in particular, Paul highlights this idea of bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Bearing with one another, another is, is the acknowledgement that people have certain weaknesses, and we're going to bump into those weaknesses occasionally, and we're going to be okay with that. We're, we're not going to like flip out every time things aren't happening as quickly as we want, or that person keeps making that same mistake, and 
we're, we're going to have a certain amount of patience with one another. And we're going to forgive each other. I appreciate that Paul says this because it is a sure thing in any kind of real relationship with people, whether it's uh, a friendship, whether it's relating to people uh, within this church body, uh, whether it's your coworkers, whether it's people you know, in your housing situation, whether they're your roommates or your spouse or your children, for sure, they will hurt you. They will do the wrong thing. And you have a choice, right? I mean, you can either say, I close the iron door on you, like fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. That's never going to happen again to me. Or we stay open to each other. And we, we offer forgiveness to one another. These things are choices. And then a little bit further down, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Uh, that word let implies that these things are not things that we choose directly. Uh, we, do, we do have some choice in the matter. We Letting something happen is receiving it. It's, it's allowing it. It's welcoming what Christ offers to us. But we can only welcome it because Christ is offering it to us. Uh, interestingly, when I think of letting the word of Christ uh, dwell richly in us, I, I naturally think of preaching or, or of Bible study and Bible reading and, and of scripture memory, all things that have been super important in my own life and in forming my own life with God. But what Paul zeroes in on here is none of those things. So I really think preaching is important. That's why I'm here doing this, right? But Paul zeroes in on something entirely different. Uh, he's, he highlights worship in song as a way of letting the word dwell within us, of expressing our thanks to God, and of teaching and admonishing, that's like warning, each other. And so uh, the, the point I'd want to make here is just this. I, I, I don't know what your favorite kind of worship music is or if you even have such a thing. Um, if you do have a favorite kind of worship music, I, I, I want to ask what kinds of songs are you hearing? Are you worshiping to? What, what songs do you, do you know the words by heart? Or do you just depend on everything being in your phone or, or projected up onto the screen? I, I love the phone. I like it so much, I've got two of them. <laughs> I got one here as a timer and the second one in my pocket. But having it in your pocket is not the same thing as having it in your heart. And when we don't know the words to things, it's really hard to be formed by them. One of my frustrations uh, and, and it is a critique of contemporary worship is that the songs change so fast. I, I brought a book this morning. This is not a classic looking one, but does anybody know what this is? So this is a hymnal. It's a, it's a book of songs that uh, was, was a, a shared like library of songs that people worshiped to and were formed by. It's why in old churches, you used to be able to say, hey, let's sing number 112, and everybody would turn to page 100 or, you know, hymn 112, and, and they could sing that together. Um, in, the, in, in the contemporary church, we don't have hymnals, right? We just have our phones, but the what we also don't have then without the hymnal is we don't have 
a, a collection of, of songs that form us, of, of things that help us to relate to God, to think on him, to, to reflect on what it means to be faithful as a disciple and faithful uh, in, my, in, my, in my community and faithful out in the world. We don't have that stuff. And so my encouragement to you would be to think about a hymnal. Uh, you don't have to go buy a pre-set uh, one, but to, to think about what are the songs that are in your heart, if there are any, right? Contemporary worship music like lasts, like if it's a really great song, how long would we sing it? Yeah, maybe a few weeks, maybe a year. Ooh, that's a really great song. That's a classic. Um, you know, this hymnal, which I love, that's why I've still got a copy, has, has songs from hundreds of years ago. Um, they've, they've stood the test of time. The music probably would not thrill some of you. Um, but it, it, it's that sense of being formed and of some continuity between me and the generations of the church that came before, that the church didn't spring like full grown when I showed up. You know, church was here before I got here. Church is going to be here after I'm long gone. And to be able to be formed by some of that is a really helpful thing. And then lastly here, Paul says that we are to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, to worship in all of life. Worship is the presenting of our bodies as living sacrifices. So worship is not showing up here on a Sunday to sing six songs. The six songs are a kind of, of workout for you to strengthen you and to make you ready or readier to live a worshipful life in the world, to live a worshipful life in your family, in your job, in the classroom, on the bus. And so, so what hopefully is happening here on a Sunday morning is you get a word from the front, you have a chance to work out, you know, in praise and worship, and you are sharpened and strengthened to be able to worship with your whole life. And the reason that we have to live this way is because we've been made one body. Uh, we belong to God and we belong to one another. Um, and so it requires a certain kind of relating to each other, uh, that compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and forgiveness and, and patience all of that is so that we can stay together. You know, we, we put on love so that, so that we can pull in one direction, so that we can share one purpose. You know, we let the word of Christ dwell within us. We let his peace rule over us. Because otherwise, it, like, we wouldn't be able to stay together. We would, we would blow apart. Next slide there. I'm just going to ask you to take a moment to reflect quietly. We are not going to share this right now, um, but we are going to pray about it. Uh, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine the kind of community that God means for us to be, the kind of community that he wants to make us, both when we're here in the building and when we're sent out into the world. What does that look like? Like, in your mind's eye, where are we? 
and what's happening, what are we doing? And who all is present? And how do people who are not a part of our church, how do they experience us and God through us? All right, will you join me in prayer? Father, we are far uh, from being everything that you've called us to be, individually and as a church family. But we bring ourselves to you. You've given us these pictures in our mind's eye of, of what we could be. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would begin to move us in some sense toward that picture. Um, I know there are a bunch of us here, and so not all the pictures may match. Um, I pray ultimately, Lord, that your picture for us would be the one that governs what our life together is like. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Give us patience and endurance to stay together and to pull in one direction. For your name's sake, amen.